Marx, successor to Newton or successor to Hegel? Those of my viewers who are familiar with current debates on Marxian philosophy will see that the account I've given of uh, in my other talks of a Newtonian and mechanistic Marx is radically different from some of the neo-Hegelian presentations that have gained ground in recent uh, decades. And I'm going to use this video to explicitly defend Marx as being a successor to Newton the person who did for history what Newton did for natural philosophy. So we first have to look at what the Newtonian method was because we get so much guff talked about the dialectical method as if that's the way to solve things. What did Marx claim he was doing? Now, this is in the preface to Capital. One nation can and should learn from others. And even when a society has got upon the right track for the discovery of the natural laws of its movement, and it is the ultimate aim of this work to lay bare the economic law of motion of modern society, it can neither clear by bold leaps nor remove by legal enactments the obstacles offered by the successive phases of its normal development it can shorten and lessen the birth pangs. Look at the language which is being used there. Natural laws of movement. Lay bare the economic law of motion. Now, this is the explicit aim from the preface of capital to establish the law of motion of modern society. In other words, he's trying to do for modern society what Newton had done to the natural world. He's quite explicit about this. And how does the method of Marx in capital fit in with the Newtonian method, with Newtonian scientific practice? Now, one of the problems with dealing with this is that whilst lots of people on the left have at least looked at Hegel, very few of them have bothered to look at Newton. Very few of them know what Newton actually said or his method of proof. So let's look at the Newtonian method. And this is a very important uh, summary that Newton himself gives. For all the difficulty of philosophy seems to consist of this from the phenomena of motions to investigate the forces of nature and from these forces then to demonstrate other phenomena. That's his concise summary of what he thinks natural philosophy or philosophy in general as a materialist is supposed to be doing. So the method of Newton in the Principia was from experiment and observation he formulates general laws of motion. How did he do that? He did it via a series of experiments with pendulums by which he was able to establish that, for instance, momentum was conserved, that acceleration was proportional to force, etc. He also um, carried over, of course, Galileo's observations. Then, by deduction using geometry, he derived the general property of centripetal forces, that's forces towards a centre. He didn't initially assume any particular force law. He was interested in forces directed towards a centre because that's obviously relevant to orbits of planets. But he works out what the characteristic of centripetal forces that are proportional to inversely proportional to distance, inversely proportional to the square of the distance, inversely proportional to the cube of the distance. What would be the effect of these different forces 
on the motion of bodies. And at this stage is dealing with the motion of bodies in a vacuum. In latter parts of the Principia, he deals with the motion of bodies through fluids. Now then, from these observations, he From these observations, he then compares, sorry, from these calculations, he then compares them with observations of the orbital radii of the satellites of Jupiter and their orbital periods. And he shows that the, the actual radii and orbital periods are only compatible with an inverse square law. And therefore, he is able to deduce that there must be an inverse square law of, of gravitation. Then from the inverse square law of gravitation, he can deduce a whole set of other things. He can deduce, for example, the trajectory of comets. He can deduce things like the shape of the Earth, the extent to which the shape of the Earth deviates from a perfect sphere due to the competing action of gravitational force and centrifugal forces. So this is what he means by from the forces predict new phenomena. So from the phenomena work out what the forces are and what the laws are, the conservation laws, and then from these you can predict things which couldn't otherwise be predicted. And this was astoundingly successful. His basic methods remain valid. On this philosopher, Newton, you can fly to Mars. Now, when we look at the method that Marx uses in capital, there is actually a great deal of similarity. The most important point is in both cases, they rely on conservation laws. In Newton, it's equal and opposite Action, conservation of momentum. Both of those amount to the same thing. In Marx, it's equal values in exchange and the sum of values are conserved in market trade. There is a homeomorphism between the form of assumption that Newton makes and the form of assumption that Marx makes. And in both cases, these are observationally based. And in both cases, having outlined the forces or outlined the basic laws of motion, they can come to conclusions. So Newton, for example, is able to demonstrate that centripetal forces sweep out equally equal areas in equal time and the gravitational force is an inverse square law. And he can then predict all these other phenomena for it. Marx can predict as a dynamical law that the rate of profit falls as capital accumulates. And he can predict that from the laws of motion that he's established for commodity exchange and for the production of surplus value. And as I say, the key to the arguments by both philosophers was the use of conservation principles. Now, everyone's familiar with the fact that Newton uses conservation principles. It's not so obvious to people that Marx was basing himself on this. Let's look at the conservation principles. Mark, I'm quoting Marx here. One quarter of corn equals X hundred weight of iron. What does this equation tells us? It tells us that in two different things, in one quarter of corn, and X hundred weights of iron, there exists in equal quantities something common to both. These two things must therefore be equal to a third, which in itself is neither one nor the other. Each of them, insofar as it is an exchange value, is reducible to this third. So if an exchange takes place between a quarter hundred weight of corn and one hundred weight of iron, both sides contain the same amount of something. This is Newton's principle of action producing an equal and opposite reaction. 
Now, Newton only had the conservation of momentum in the Principia, but his French popularizer, Emily du Châtelet, who wrote the first French physics textbook, extended this to the conservation of energy. This is what, in the English translation of her book, when the product of the mass of the square of the speed is taken as force, it is easy to prove that the forces vives always remain the same, although the quantity of motion varies perhaps at each instant. And in all cases, especially in that which I've cited from, from Mr. Newton, the forces vives stay invariable. Forces vives is the term she used for what we now call energy. She is saying that the trajectory of a body under gravity, in the trajectory of a body under gravity, the sum of potential and kinetic energy, that is to say what she calls force vives, living force, remains constant. By the 1830s, mechanics had been reformulated by the Irish physicist Hamilton on the principle of the conservation of energy, such that the trajectories that moving bodies take were seen to be fully constrained by this. And this is true whether you're talking about planets, pendulums, a weight bobbing on a spring. All of these can be analysed in terms of Hamilton's equations, which are specified in terms of the conservation of energy. And Engels and Marx are known to have been discussing the conservation of energy in the decade before Marx wrote Capital. For instance, this letter survives. Another result that would have delighted old Hegel is the correlation of forces in physics, or the law whereby mechanical motion, i.e. mechanical force, e.g. through friction, is in giving given conditions converted into heat, heat into light, light into chemical affinity, chemical t affinity, etc. in a voltaic pile, into electricity, the latter into magnetism. They knew that energy forms exchange with one another in such a way that the total is conserved. Now, this is relatively modern science, relatively modern, from the 1830s. Um, and they're talking about it 25 years later. It's like us talking about um, dark matter or something like that. Now, Marx's prior step of establishing the exchange, exchanges and equivalence relation with a conserved substance is, is vitally important for how he analyzes surplus value. He has this famous symbolic analysis of the circulation of commodities C1 to M to C2. A seller starts with commodity 1, C1, exchanges it for money M of equal value, and then uses the money to purchase a commodity 2, C2. Now since exchange is an equivalence relation, and since equivalence relations are transitive, the value at the start and the finish must be the same. That is to say, C1 must be identical to C2. OK, that's a conservation law. All's fair and good until he points out that this isn't what capitalists do. It's evident that in the circuit of capital, MCM prime, this violates the equivalence property of commodity exchange. So it has a violation of conservation. That is the basic contradiction that he's dealing with. It follows that since commodity market relations are conservative, they're governed by a conservation law, surplus value cannot arise in commodity market relations. And this is a very important point about Marx. You cannot derive surplus value just from people exchanging commodities with one another. It has to arise outside of the market in production relations. And in this context, Marx's great innovation was the distinction between labour and labour power, the ability to work. It's not labour that capitalists purchased. They hired labour power, the ability to work. Where did he get this distinction from? How come 
all the previous economists had simply said wages are the price of labour, not the price of labour power. Well, you've got to understand that Marx and Engels were steampunk communists. The answer to this is the steam engine. In the Victorian age, factory managers like Engels hired steam engines rated by their horsepower. They all knew the difference between work done and power as the ability to do work when it came to their engines. They had to specify how many horsepower they needed to turn the spinning machines in their mills. And they knew that the amount of work you could get out of an engine was set by a maximum horsepower and the amount of work you got out of it was the number of hours you kept the engine running. If you only ran the engine for eight hours of the day, you got less real work out of it. If you could run it for a 12 hour day, you got more work out of it. So this was a basic reality that every factory manager knew. So Marx's distinction between labour and labour power rested on the engineering common sense of the Victorian steam age. We're not familiar with things like indicator diagrams to measure the power of a steam engine. But if you go and look at 19th century books on what factory engine to get, they're full of things like indicator diagrams, which tell you what the power delivered each stroke, or the work delivered each stroke of a steam engine was. As Mao said, correct ideas don't fall from the sky. They come from social practice. Once the social practice of production had advanced to steam technology, then the secret of labour power was revealed. Speaking of Aristotle's inability to determine that labour itself was a source of value, Marx wrote, Greek society was founded on slavery and therefore had as its natural basis the inequality of men and their labour powers. The secret of the expression of value namely that all kinds of labour are equal and equivalent because so far as they are human labour in general cannot be deciphered until the notion of human equality has already acquired the fixity of a popular prejudice. Now the same thing applies to Marx's own advance. Adam Smith was under a similar handicap. Smith wrote when most work was still powered by human muscles. At that point, the distinction that Marx made between labour and labour power was unthinkable. No one had actually thought of the distinction between work and power until Watt came up with the idea of the horsepower for measuring his steam engines. Till there was an objective need to measure work, physical work, the concepts weren't developed. But when Marx was writing, after a century or more mechanical advance, most of the energy used in British industry came from steam engines, not human muscles. And the distinction between work and power had then entered into the popular consciousness of the steam age. Everyone knew what horsepower were. So the term labour power is just a straightforward extension to what people were already used to thinking of. Marx's work is deeply embedded in the machine age. His materialism is mechanical in two senses. The first is that it rests on ideas drawn from theoretical mechanics. So theoretical mechanics is what is now called Newtonian mechanics and is the work of people like Newton, Du Châtelet, Lagrange, Hamilton. This is based on the idea of conservation laws, laws of motion and the concept of energy. All of these metaphors are brought in into capital, but not only the metaphors, the actual formal properties of the logical argument are the same. 
And also, his analysis of exploitation rests on concepts derived from practical mechanics. The difference between work and power, which was a practical thing arrived at by the companies which were selling steam engines. And they need to rate what was being done. I hope to show in later presentations that the Newtonian idea of cyclical motion and long-term tendencies is built into Marx's analysis as well.